Okay, thank you, Sergey. So we'll get to the hyenas in the uh, last part of the talk. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about some projects that were part of my PhD and some stuff that I did here. So let's start with a small riddle for you. Who was found here? Any ideas? I expected that most of you as Americans would remember him. Um, so how did they find Saddam Hussein? It wasn't that easy. Uh, so uh, exactly 10 years ago, in April 2003, uh, the American military invaded Baghdad, and Saddam naturally was not to be found. And the uh, basic conception was that if they are able to trap most of his top officers in the army and uh, uh, the ministers of his government, uh, well, one of them will uh, lead them to Saddam. But that was not true, although they did, uh, they were able to trap many of them, no one knew where Saddam is. And the breakthrough came only when some officers in a specific division that had background in sociology um, started to interrogate many of Saddam's uh, big family and created this kind of social network that describes the associations um, in Saddam's big family. And from this network, they were able to identify uh, two specific cousins of Saddam, and he had many cousins, it's not like our families, um, that uh, seem to be very central in this network. And when they were able to trap these uh, two cousins, they led them uh, to where Saddam uh, hid. So uh, this is some kind of motivation to study social networks, and social networks have been studying um, for a long time in humans but there are some inherent problems with studying them in humans. And the basic uh, problem is that there are practical and ethical issues with uh, following humans all the time. So uh, networks are uh, based on some proxies. So this network, for example, uh, each uh, node here is an individual. It is from the famous Christakis and Fowler uh, study that showed uh, that um, smoking and obesity are uh, contagious. So for example, this network is based on uh, questionnaires. And we all know that um, in questionnaires, humans can tell the truth, but sometimes they will not uh, tell the whole truth. And another example is this uh, social network that is based on email data. But we all know that email, uh, our email interactions are not really representative of all our social interactions. So I study social networks in animals, and specifically my PhD was on uh, the rock hyrax. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the rock hyrax and, and our study system. Um, so this study has, is managed by Professor Eli Geffen from Tel Aviv University. And a few words about the rock hyrax. It's a diurnal herbivore. It lives in groups of um, usually one strong male and multiple females with their um, juveniles and um, pups, and there is uh, males disperse when they reach uh, adulthood uh, around the age of uh, a year and a half or two years, and they live uh, usually uh, in solitary in the periphery of the groups, and they will try to uh, replace one of the alpha males of the groups when they uh, are able to do it, and some of them will never be able to do it. Mating is synchronized, and um, I'll talk about it a little bit later. It's, it occurs during a short uh, period of two or three weeks, uh, two to three weeks in the uh, summer. And um, in the mating season, females may mate with multiple uh, males, so not only with the um, uh, resident male in their group. And uh, there's a rich vocal communication, which was the main uh, thing I actually started my PhD with. And our study uh, is conducted in um, En Gedi on the shore of the Dead Sea uh, in the southeast part of Israel. And here we have uh, been following around 100 individuals uh, at a time in two separate uh, populations. And uh, this is how the, this uh, habitat looks like. So there's a lot of rocks for the hyraxes to hide in and some vegetation. And as you can see, it's a desert. Um, so every year we trap each hyrax in the population in order to uh, mark them and take some measurements. And um, here you can see the, the collar that we 
uh, attack with a tag so we can identify them uh, from a distance without uh, inter interfering with their uh, activity. Um, so for each Hyrax, we know a lot about it, including its uh, date of birth and sometimes uh, of death, um, some morphometrics, uh, social interactions, hormonal profile, and genetic profile. And uh, this has been running for more than 13 years, so got a lot of data about this uh, population. And um, my um, actually main part of the PhD was focused on Hyrax singing, so I can't let you go without listening to one song, which is performed only by males. <laughs> So this was part of a song that uh, can last uh, usually up to 10 minutes. And we know that uh, this song can code at least potentially a lot of information about the singer, including its size and weight, its social rank, uh, levels of different hormones, and individual identity. And we know that uh, songs plays, uh, play a role in male-male communication. And we assume they also play a role uh, in uh, advertising male quality to females. Um, and when observing, uh, okay, so I attached these uh, devices, these uh, tiny recorders to male to, to males that were um, programmed to record any of their uh, sounds and activities. And then the males were set free uh, for uh, four to eight days until I was able to trap them again. And from these recorders, I could learn a lot about uh, what Hyraxes actually do, because not uh, always you can observe them. So here, each column is one day, and it is jittered for some clarity. And the size of the circle represents the duration of activity. And this is the time of the day. So we can see that uh, a typical Hyrax day is getting up around 5.30 AM, doing some movements and foraging some social sounds, including singing, and then it takes a nap um, around the, the af uh, afternoon and resumes activity in the evening for uh, some more foraging. And usually it goes to sleep around 9 p.m. and is not very active during most of the night. And um, when observing the hyraxes, we recorded, we rec recorded many social interactions. So here we can see these three individuals in a positive interaction resting together. And here we can see another group of hyraxes um, resting. And uh, these uh, two are actually resting after mating. But we don't have three such observations. We got 18,000. And I was wondering, how can we quantify this data? What can we learn from it about uh, their social lives? And uh, the answer, as I found, is in using social network analysis. <coughs> so here we can see uh, an example of a social network of one of our populations from uh, a data accumulated over one uh, field season. So we can see the basic group structure of uh, females with one male. And uh, most of the other males are solitary. You can see some juveniles in uh, this group. And we can actually measure some um, quantities. So in this case, the network is binary, so we don't see uh, the strength of the ties here. But we can measure that. And we can measure the level of centrality of each individual in the network. And this individual, for example, has what we uh, call high between a centrality. So it could serve as a bridge between these two groups. And it may be important, for example, for the transfer of disease. So we can uh, learn about the, a lot about the social structure. And that is actually quite new uh, in studying animal sociality. If you look for papers, you'll find so many papers about group size, which is very important, but neglects the internal social structure. You'll find many papers about social rank, which is also important, but is calculated only from the negative interactions. And again, neglects all the data that is found in positive interactions. And social network analysis allows us to learn a lot more about the social structure. 
Um, so when uh, we started analyzing the structure of different groups, we noticed that here the width of the um, uh, line represents the strength of the tie, and the size of the circle represents the level of centrality of the individual. So if you look at these two top groups, you'll see that uh, individuals are uh, mostly central to the same level. So the um, social associations are spread relatively evenly. And uh, in contrast, in this group, you'll see that some individuals are uh, very central while others are weakly connected. And we were interested uh, to find if this uh, level, different level of, so of uh, centrality in the network affects uh, survival or individual longevity. And we didn't find this correlation in the individual level. So we didn't find that individual uh, that, were, that were more uh, central in their group were not uh, able to survive longer. But we did find a co the correlation um, in the group level. Um, and I mean that groups in which the social ties were uh, more evenly spread, where the centrality uh, standard deviation was lower, uh, individuals in this group survived better. And individuals. So centrality is actually the summary of your uh, strength, of your, the strength of your ties. Okay? Um, so um, in, in this graph, we, since the individual lived in a specific group for uh, a few years, we averaged the uh, standard deviation that he uh, had in the years that he lived in the group, and then we correlated with individual longevity. And this uh, result actually parallels similar results from humans in which it was found that when comparing uh, across countries, countries in which there's more social equality, um, people living in these countries are healthier and um, uh, survive longer, and um, I guess that's it. And now I'd like to move to a different um, type of analysis of the network. And here I uh, want to present the problem as follows. So that's me, and I'm a friend of Mike here, and Mike is a friend of John, but I don't really like John. Um, so there's an inherent social tension here. And I guess you all know the situation. We all have a friend, but we don't really like his friend. And there's always this tension, like, what if Mike invites both of us to a party? Will I be happy to go to a party with John? So this kind of uh, look at triads is actually a part of what is called network motif analysis. So networks are built from these basic building blocks. And in a very simple network, such as this grid, you will find only one type of motif, but in uh, more uh, realistic networks, you'll find multiple types of different motif. And I was interested in a theory that was suggested by an Austrian psychologist named uh, Heider back in 1946. And he looked at uh, different triads and um, suggested that if you defined each two individuals as friends or enemies or friends or non-friends, so you define them as uh, having a plus relationship or a minus relationship, you get four types of triads. So let's look at them. And uh, the basic plus, plus, plus uh, triad is considered to be balanced in, in terms of uh, structural balance. So um, there's no social tension in, in if all individuals here are friends of each other. And uh, this one is uh, similar to the one I showed earlier. This is called plus, plus, minus triad. So there's some social tension here because of different uh, interests for each individual. And the plus, minus, minus triad is again considered to be balanced. Although there are negative associations here, um, there is no social tension, for example, between A and B. They have both the same interest uh, regarding C. They, they are both enemies of C. And as for the minus, minus, minus triad, the classic theory of structural balance suggests that it is unbalanced and we would expect a um, positive association to form between any two individuals against the third one. Uh, but according to what is called weak structural balance, this allows this one to be balanced and allows actually the situation of three different 
individuals that are all enemies of each other or three different groups. Um, so this um, uh, theory was proved to be relevant for uh, humans and uh, was shown in different kind of groups and also in some social uh, online social networks and was also suggested as the main uh, reason to the as a, the main trigger for World War One uh, as the change of balance between countries um, caused uh, the the war to erupt and I was interested uh, um, to test if it's relevant also for animal societies and it was not tested in any other species so I took the Hyrax data, and I defined each uh, two individuals as uh, friends or enemies in a very simple way. I, they were defined as friends if they were uh, observed in more positive than negative social interactions during one field season, and otherwise I defined them as enemies or actually more accurately non-friends. And from that I created, um, from years that I had good data, uh, 11 social networks, and you can see the basic uh, group structure um, of, of these uh, uh, networks. So these are from two populations and uh, different years. And then in order to test for uh, the existence of structural balance, I uh, had to compare these networks to a set of random networks. So for each of these networks, I created a set of random networks, and I used two different models in one model. I retained the number of positive and negative uh, associations. And in another model, uh, I also retained the degree distribution. So it, it's actually retaining the, the number of uh, friends that each individual has in the network. And then I compared the real network to these uh, random networks and counted if I have more or less uh, of each uh, triad type. And the result for the two m different models is very similar. Um, and we show that we see that um, for all 11 networks, the plus 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 triads that are considered balanced were more common than expected by chance. And in contrast, the plus plus minus triads, the unbalanced one, were less common than expected by chance in all networks. As for the plus minus minus triads, that is again considered to be balanced, it was more common than expected by chance in seven networks, and the result was not significant in four networks. And as for the minus, minus, minus triads, it was uh, preferable in five networks and less common than expected by chance in one network. So taken together, uh, this uh, scenario suggests that uh, what we see here is what is called weak structural balance, in which the, these minus, minus, minus triads are um, uh, more favorable than not by the hierarchies. And then I ask myself if it is actually, you know, do the hierarchies actually care about all that? And if they care about it, so, or maybe it's actually, you know, a result of a different process. And if they care about it, we all know that networks are dynamic and they change in time. And if they care about it, I would expect them to change the unbalanced triad and retain um, the balanced ones. And uh, this is the result that I get. So here I followed each specific triad, if the three individuals survived for the next year, I checked what happened to this triad. And if you look at the diagonal here, you can see that the uh, balanced triads, they, they mostly retained in the same configuration, while the plus plus minus triad, only 9% of them remained in, in this configuration, and most of them changed to uh, balanced triads. So it seems like hierarchies do perceive the unbalanced triad as something that uh, um, the, is not convenient for them, that creates some tension for them, and they actively change them. And if they care about it and they change them, so why is the network not fully balanced yet? Why do we still see some uh, number of um, unbalanced triads in each network? So uh, we have hypothesized that it may be related to new individuals in the network, that in the hierarchies are usually pups that are born to females in the network, or um, males that migrate into the population from other populations. And indeed, we find that the proportion of, um, uh, of new individuals in unbalanced triad is significantly higher than the proportion in all triads. And that was irrelevant to the number of positive or negative uh, associations they form. So it seems like 
the state of the network in terms of balance is um, subject to two different forces. On the one hand, structural balance pulls it into balance, and on the other hand, new individuals constantly introduce um, uh, imbalance or instability. So to summarize uh, this part, I suggest that structural balance may play a role in the evolution of social network or social structure by selecting against specific um, structures, and it may actually be um, a main force behind what we see, the, the group structure that we see in many populations. Because if uh, you want the network to be balanced, you can't have this kind of grid where some are friends of uh, others, but they are friends of, um, or in positive associations with individuals that are not part of their group. And we see that structural balance allows some predictions of social uh, changes that are not available if we analyzed only diet. So if I'm a friend of, of uh, someone, I can only make a trivial prediction that I will remain his friend. But with triads, we see that we can make uh, some predictions that are not trivial. And um, I think it may be widespread in species where the social structure is stable and be of less relevance when, um, for example, in uh, large herds of zebras, when the social structure constantly changes, I think that the force of structural balance is less relevant. And now I want to quite briefly describe uh, some project I am working with a master's student in Ali Geffen's lab um, uh, named Einat Braziv. So Inat is studying the mating patterns of the hyraxes, and as I mentioned, they mate during a short time of two to three weeks in a year, and um, Inat was uh, there almost 24 hours in the field during this time in order to observe as many uh, matings as uh, possible, and we found some interesting uh, stuff. So. Um, how can the social network affect sexual selection? Sexual selection is important as a driver of evolution, is um, relevant for speciation, for rate of mutation, and for uh, molecular evolution. And when measuring uh, male reproductive success, this is the classical equation uh, in which the total variance in uh, male reproductive success is dependent on uh, three variables. One is the number of females mated by a male. The second is the average clutch size produced by uh, these females. And the third is the average proportion of, of the clutch of eggs fertilized by a male and some uh, source of error. But implicit in this um, equation is the assumption of random social mixing. And I hope that by this stage I convince you that this is not the case. Uh, so uh, what I did is I created these networks, and uh, this is an example of, uh, this is not actually a social network, it is a sexual network by, because it represents only sexual interactions. And here the males are black and females are gray. And um, what we see here are not only mating events, but also events in which a male uh, approach a female for mating, and in this case she rejected it, so we don't see an arrow goes in the other direction, and if they did mate, you'll see um, something like that when the arrow goes in both directions. And we can see that there is a lot of variation here. Some males, for example, this one here in the middle, enjoys access to three different females with no competition from other males. Some males may enjoy access to many females, but they have also competition with with other males that uh, access these females, approach these females as well. Uh, and some males have access to only, let's say, one female and is in competition with this one. And uh, we were interested in, in um, uh, finding what actually affects a female decision to, to mate with a male. So in some cases, the female rejects the male. In some cases, she agrees to uh, mate it. And um, usually when considering this question, uh, people focus on the traits of, of the relevant male that approach the female. But we, were, w uh, we extracted from this social network, from this sexual network, also the properties 
of the competitors. So if this uh, female here was um, approached by four different males, we uh, use the logistic regression to test the traits of the specific male, but also the traits of his uh, competitors. And the idea is that um, if a female makes a, deci a, t a decision according to some uh, basic rule, for example, I would mate with the largest male or the male with the highest social rank, um, so her decision should be made not according to the uh, average of the population, but according to the possibilities that she specifically uh, has. And uh, this female, if she has four different uh, possibilities, maybe all of them are smaller, maybe all of them are of um, um, lower social rank, but if she can still use this rule and mate uh, one of them. And if we don't take into consideration the competitors, we may uh, neglect and we, we may not um, find uh, relevance for some of these traits. And our result is ki uh, um, kind of uh, counterintuitive. So the um, basic prediction of, of uh, the model, um, this is a model by C et al, but there are other uh, uh, similar models, is that if a female has more a higher quality male around her, she would be more choosy. That also what I would uh, think. But we find an opposite result. We find a higher chance of copulation if the competitors are higher ranked. So I suggest that it's kind of the female telling the male, it's not you, it's them. I make the decision not according to the approaching male traits, but according to his competitors. And in trying to explain this result, I suggest that females may be less choosy when their potential partners are higher ranked because they may have more uh, option around them. So in that case, a female may know that her uh, uh, other options may, um, may, may have better options uh, around her. And the story is actually more complicated uh, and other uh, things may be taken into account uh, by the female because we see different, uh, several phenomena. So one thing we see, we observed is sperm ejection. So in some cases you would see, a, a observe a female mating with a male, but after the mating she would eject his uh, sperm. So actually this male thinks that he mated the female, but he's not going to use it. We see mate guarding that must be relevant. So uh, in, in many cases after mating, the male would mate, would guard the female. And I'm sure that a female would take into account in making her decision if uh, the male is going to guard her or not. And we also observe infanticide. So in some cases, uh, males um, would kill uh, the pups of uh, females and uh, uh, it's a known phenomenon in primates that uh, females may mate with multiple males in order to uh, have them think that they are may, may be the fathers of these um, um, of her uh, offspring, uh, so they will protect them or at least not harm them. So uh, until now, most of it was about static networks, and uh, actually most studies about uh, animal social networks in recent years were about static networks, which is uh, actually taking some. Um, data and uh, construct, constructing a social network from it and we uh, and and analyzing it but i think that um, analyzing a static network is a bit like looking at a painting and trying to understand the process of how this painting was painted and uh, it would be much uh, more helpful to observe the painter drawing it so I think that uh, analyzing how the social network changes in time may help us to understand what factors actually uh, affect the network structure. And these factors could be of three um, different categories. So the first one is external factors like um, competitors or pre-availability or climate, stuff like that. The second uh, group of factors is internal network rules. So one of the rules is structural balance. Another one could be the number of friends that we can man maintain. 
which is limited unless we're on Facebook. And uh, the third uh, category is uh, individual traits. So one known phenomenon is that of network autocorrelation, that social ties occur more frequently among similar individuals. And um, uh, one of the unsolved questions about network autocorrelation is the process behind it. Do actually similar individuals tend to become friends, the process of homophily? So if I'm a smoker, I become a friend of another smoker, or maybe alternatively it's assimilation. I'm not a smoker, but if my friends are smokers, I become a smoker. So I was interested in um, analyzing um, so social networks from a long-term project of social animals, and I'm glad I found uh, a uh, Kay Holcomb, Professor Kay Holcomb from Michigan State University, and she's been studying the spotted hyena for 25 years in Kenya, and uh, she and her um, assistants and students followed 1,500 individuals and they've got about 85,000 observations during the years. And this data set is a, a treasure for me to analyze how the social network uh, change and what factors affect it, it, its change. So this is Kay's effort here and this is my effort here in this project. And um, the first thing I did is uh, creating this animation that shows how uh, such how dynamic is uh, the network and in this case each slice represent uh, one uh, month of interactions and I'm using the Siena approach which uh, uh, stands for simulation investigation for empirical network analysis and this is an approach developed by uh, Tom Snyders from Oxford so I'll uh, tell you a little bit about uh, this uh, modeling uh, idea so it is an actor-based model, um, and the networks are treated as dependent variables. And I uh, choose some time frame and actually construct different networks for each uh, time step. And the assumption is that it's a Markov process, so there's no memory, and the changes in the network are only dependent on its last uh, position. And another assumption is that microsteps generate uh, the network dynamics. Uh, so in each uh, microsteps, microstep, um, two actors are chosen randomly and they get the opportunity to change uh, their tie. And the direction of change is de determined by an objective function that is uh, dependent on the model that was uh, stated and the probability of change depends on a comparison of the change against other possibilities. So, for example, of a microstep, uh, we see these two individuals, and let's say they are in association, and now they have to uh, take a decision if they will retain their tie or delete it. And their uh, decision will be dependent on the model. So, for example, if I uh, stated a model in which um, males should be connected to other males, and these two are males, they will have higher probability to retain their tie. And uh, of course, other parameters uh, could affect uh, this decision. And after I get some model, I have to uh, test for its goodness of it by comparing um, the model network versus the uh, real network and using different parameters than those that were modeled in order to uh, check if actually I, I get networks that are uh, similar to the real ones. So I want to present some preliminary results which are only from a chunk of the data and uh, not using all parameters. So there are five effects that were found. Uh, one is triad transitivity. So um, one process that affects the network structure is the tendency to form more plus, plus, plus uh, triads. And there's another effect of small number of two path, which in other words is a small number of plus, plus, minus triads. So if you remember structural balance, it hints at, at its existence also in this system. There is another effect of status similarity. So um, immigrants 
tend to form connections with other immigrants, residents, with other uh, residents, and so on. And there is a stat status effect, so residents form more connections than immigrants, and they, in turn, form more connections than transients. And another last effect is a sex effect, so males form more connections than females. But again, these are preliminary re results, and I'm intending to add more parameters uh, to the model, and also to uh, use or to test for two-way influence. So until now, it was how different parameters affect the network struct structure, but the network structure in turn should affect the individuals that uh, form this network. So some individual traits are usually not changing, but others such as size and social rank um, should be able to change. And in this uh, model, I'll, uh, the, the actors will get the opportunity to change either a tie or a trait value. So uh, I will model how the network affects the individuals and how they affect the network in turn. Okay, some take home messages. Social structure is important and local individual choices shape the social network and the social network in turn affects sexual selection and longevity. So there is uh, multiple interaction between the network and its members. And I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators from Eli Geffen's uh, lab in Tel Aviv University and uh, Kay Holkamp and some sources of funding. And thank you. So I, I guess the question is why there are groups? Now, why why actually there is the, this group structure? It, it mm -hmm. and and then why, uh, for example, in the hierarchs, but but that's also relevant in many other species. You see, so uh, a little, a very little number of positive interactions between uh, members of different groups. Why can't they just be, you know, in a, this huge grid that? I don't care about, I mean, I may uh, sleep with my group members, but I, uh, why, why uh, should I be, you know, not a friend or an enemy of the others? And I suggest that structural balance is a strong force in shaping this stru structure. And if, if, you, if you already think that a group is a, the, the group structure is a given, so structural balance, as you suggested, may be just a byproduct. So I think that if, if structural, but yeah, it's kind of an egg and uh, hand problem, but I think that if structural balance w would not be important, so you may be a friend of some of the group members, but not of the others, but it's not uh, what we see usually.
Over over all years, like great one network from all all the years. Yeah. So the problem with creating such a network is that many individuals uh, live or join the network in in the middle. So if you're creating a network for let's say five years. You, you will see that some are not connected to each other, but they were actually not present in the same time. So this is kind of misleading. Yeah, but so you can construct a group from only individuals that were available during this time. Is that what you mean? You, during this, yeah, let's say. Yeah, so you'll get some kind of summary of, of the associations over a very long time, but I, I would actually be happier to construct networks from smaller uh, time scales, but it's a, a, a problem of data because I uh, usually have to accumulate some, um, a few months of data in order to have a good representation of the social structure. Now, if I will construct the network from, let's say, one week of data, so in this yeah, one week I may have missed, you know. Yeah, so, so in, in the AINA I started from analyzing uh, changes over years, but I want to go to a, a lower resolution and, you know, maybe analyze changes over months, uh, if it's, it's going to be possible. in behavior or, or in the social network structure? Yes, so, so some, uh, actually that, that should be the result from, from the model of, of the changes in the social network, right? I mean, if, you, if, if I find rules that affect the network and I get a specific state of the network, I may be able to tell you that uh, some ties should be uh, deleted and sub should be added, but uh, of course it's also stochastic, right? Yeah, so, so actually for both pieces, I use the basic data of um, um, going in the same group or, or doing some what we call coordinated activity in a specific day. That's, that's the resolution that I use. And uh, it is a bit different from, for example, in primates, you can create networks from grooming networks and stuff like that. But in, in um, species like the Hyrax and the Aina, there's no grooming and there's, there's not a lot of contact. I mean, in Aina there are a lot of fights, but that's a different kind of interaction. So, so in that case, actually, uh, the basic data is uh, a group that you have observed in a specific day doing some coordinated activity, which could be emerging from the same sleeping den or uh, in the Aina's going together uh, to hunt or stuff like that. Yeah, so, so this function is a, a multinomial legit function. And if I, I have to state some model based on some hypothesis, okay? So the uh, parameters of the model could be, for example, the existence of uh, plus, plus, plus triads or the formation of ties 
between uh, individuals with a specific trait like same sex or same social rank or different sex, okay? And, and then um, I, uh, the model tries to optimize, or actually, let's say, two individuals in a micro step are making the decision by optimizing this uh, function, okay? They, they uh, have to make a decision if to retain or add or delete a tie according to the result of this uh, function. Yeah. yeah, but then I mean it could go like in uh, to to in both directions. I mean I could uh, I well I entered the model for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, same sex and it could go in both directions. Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't try it. I guess it would be more complicated, but, um, it, well, I guess the, the, the easy answer is I don't know. And I, I do think that triads are a basic block and actually each, let's say, four-member uh, uh, structure is based ac actually on, on triads, right? But it could affect, you know, in, in in the same way that triads uh, show different predictions than dyads, it could be different. And I don't really think that, you know, hyraxes or any other species, you know, keep thinking about triplets of individuals. I guess they don't. But it's just a simplification of the process um, that we all think of when we think about um, some friends and their uh, relationships, okay, like, like third-party relationships. Yeah.